Yeah, I have a quick question, I guess, kind of about yeah. um, path independence of these contour integrations, because so when we see path independence, like in real valued functions, um, we always think of like a conservative force or something like that. Is oh, this, yeah, good is question. No, you're right. You're right. Analytic functions being conservative, like does that even make sense to say, I guess? No, no, you're right, and it's an extremely good question. Question. Um, it's, what you say is very true. Let me just get the pretty picture I started with. So, to prove this, we use the symmetry, which was this amphitwist. So, you know, one proof was to say that for small shapes, what holomorphic mappings or analytic mappings or conformal mappings do is they conform, they keep the same form. So that was an example of invariant. And that's the real reason why this contour integral is zero, because all the little shapes change the keep their form under the mapping and the cancellations happen because of that. So that's in that case example of invariance. It's this conformal invariance. Just like uh, you know, energy is invariant in Hamiltonian systems, uh, where you have symplectic maps rather than conformal. So symplectic maps preserve small volumes in the phase space, you know, delta, that dp times dq, uh, the con configuration infinitesimal momentum, dual momentum infinitesimal, and that's why uh, energy is conserved under Hamiltonian evolution, which preserves these volumes, these symplectic volumes. So Hamiltonian or canonical transformation start in a phase space, and after a while, the phase space distribution of trajectory has changed, but uh, the little areas of the little symplectic volumes have not changed. And for analytic mapping, it's not that, but it's this conformal mapping. So you're right, you know, there is a beautiful result due to Emmy Noether, who proved that when you have an invariance and you have Lagrangian principle, variational principle, describing equations of motions, you should have conserved quantities. And here, you know, conserved quantities are zero or one. You either have a pole, don't have a pole, but stuff like that. So that was... Uh, a good question. So I was wondering more questions. If, yeah, I was wondering if uh, Adam's question had anything to do with like viewing the uh, function of z, like a holomorphic f of z, as like having you know the real part, real function u, and a imaginary function v, like the u plus iv as like yeah. two components of a gradient uh, of some maybe potential function, right? And they're related by the cauchy riemann conditions. So. Yeah, that, you know, that I don't see. Okay. I mean, they're profoundly, you and we are profoundly related, as you say, by cauchy riemann and, and they look like derivatives. But I don't see the symplectic structure. You know, the symplectic structure for Hamiltonian mechanics, for classical mechanics, is that one of the derivatives, which is uh, Q dot, which is the velocity in configuration space, is a gradient of Hamilton's function with respect to momentum. And the other one, velocity in the or acceleration change of the momentum, uh, p dot, is minus the gradient. And this combination is called a symplectic combination. And that's what uh, preserves phase space volumes. 
So, you know, it looks similar when you think of analytic functions, but I, I see this as two distinct, uh, very different symmetries. You know, I don't see them bo as both symplectic. I find the uh, analytic function. Now, you know, the thing about analytic function, it's very beautiful, uh, but it only works in complex planes. So it only works in two dimensions. Whereas mechanical principle of uh, having dual, here the duals are, you know, real and imaginary part. In mechanics, the duals are momentum, uh, configuration and momentum. <coughs> That's beautiful in mechanics because it works in any dimension for any number of particles. So I see them as very distinct, and the applications in modern particle physics and condensed matter physics also have a different flavor. There's something called conformal field theory, which is very powerful, but it uses this symmetry of the complex functions. And, you know, nothing to do with uh, momenta and positions. I might be wrong, but that's how I see it. Okay. Uh, there, I'm, I'm trying to remember, there's a like a easy way for you to verify if a field is conservative. I think it's like the, the mixed partials are equal or something like that. I don't know. If yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very quick, but basically the second derivative of the Hamiltonian is a symmetric function. It's called mm -hmm. Hessian sometimes, mm -hmm. if, you know, you might see that word. Whereas a minus sign shows up in the in the Hamilton's equation of motion because the acceleration is minus the gradient of the potential. And um, that minus sign uh, makes the second variation vanish and that's how you get con conservation. Okay. So, I mean, if you were to uh, use the cauchy riemann conditions, would you get the same thing? Maybe I'm just asking and it's not applicable at all, but... Maybe you're right, you know, because so far we are in Cauchy Riemann, we are always using the first derivative. The Cauchy Riemann is, you know, a set of derivatives of real and imaginary part of a function with respect to real and imaginary part of the coordinate in two dimensional plane. And that gives us four derivatives. And it turns out, uh, you know, there are two relations among them. So morally, you only have one complex function. The other one you can get by a gradient. Now it's possible that if I look at the second derivatives of that thing, I get a zero. I think I I think I know what you're what you're saying, and I I think it does show that because if because we know that u x x plus uyy has to equal zero because these functions have to be um, harmonic. And yeah, so if you, you're if right, then you the you're right. to Riemann equations. No, you're right, we, we did UYY. compute Laplacians and we showed the harmonic yeah. functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so if you do that with the cauchy Riemann equations, I think you would get that, like, at least that vxy equals vyx. The cross term, uh, cancelled out because by the symmetry, if you took derivative in two orders, it doesn't matter, and they showed up with minus signs. That's mm -hmm. why we got the Laplacian. We just got the second derivative with respect to real and second derivative with respect to, and we got two harmonic functions. So maybe it is a trivial case, and, you know, harmonic functions are as good mechanical system as you want because they are describe the oscillations of harmonic oscillators. So, uh, so the only problem 
is that it doesn't generalize to higher dimensions. You know, it just works in a complex plane. So then there is a bit of history that in a way involves Georgia Tech. David Finkelstein, who used to be professor here, decided to develop quaternionic field theory, which is, you know, going from complex numbers in two dimensions to numbers in four dimensions. And he's one of the people who invented Higgs effect. Uh, he was maybe, well, number of them did it independently, but, you know, Higgs is very important for modern particle physics because the CERN measured the mass of the Higgs and it's a cornerstone of standard model of particle physics. And what happened to Finkelstein and his collaborators, they discovered that there should be a Higgs, which wasn't called the Higgs because it was done independently before Higgs, etc. cetera. Uh, but then they had to give up because they used this generalization going from complex to quaternionic, and there is no good way to proceed from there. And uh, particle physics went a different way using Lie groups and symmetries, uh, not using this kind of tricks in a complex or quaternionic plane. So he invented the Higgs, but it's irrelevant because he didn't know how to apply it to a case where you have more than, you know, proton and neutron. Proton and neutron are described by SU2, which is same as Higgs, but he didn't know how to do SU3 or color or, you know, all the other stuff that go into standard models today. Awesome, I see Bar you. has a new totally crazy background. I'll study it later when it shows up. I saw in the colloquium on Monday that you had a crazy background going on of some kind. Uh, yes, I have many. <laughs> I don't I don't remember what it was, but I remember logging in and seeing. No, it. you know, at some point I get really bored. You know, I just go someplace else, but I won't, uh, went to Intelligentsia Cafe, which is around corner. <laughs> anyway, but I just go someplace because, you know, this guy was going 15 minutes over. That's criminal. You know, when you give a colloquium, you do 50 minutes and you're done. I mean, you don't, can't do this to humans. Yeah, you, but professor, say, don't. Two hours. Yeah, I mean, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, Just I did not have time sing your song. You have 50 minutes. I mean, you yeah. know, you know, you have lived long life. You know, it's 50 minutes. So why torture us 15 minutes more with? some infinite detail of condensed matter physics, which is very painful. So, but it's, yeah. you know, it's fun for three people who care, but I mean, I care in some general way, but I don't understand it at that level of detail. Okay, be brave. Uh, we do complex analysis next week, uh, deriving integrals for your quantum mechanics and electromagnetism courses. And then we move on into higher dimensions where complex analysis doesn't help, but ideas of symmetries do. So cool. that's the you know path ahead. Thank you. Yeah, sorry that Thanks. I didn't open my camera. I was like, I was kind of like a bit messy recently, like crazy about homework stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I'm very messy. I didn't shave, but what can I do? Yeah. This is my life. The... Yeah, cool. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Vincent. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Stay healthy. Definitely. I'm not going to go to any Nazi rallies.